Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is Richard Feldman, who's, among other things, the former president of the American Independent Music Publishers. And uh, he's going to talk all about publishing in today's music world, and I'm sure you're going to find it really interesting and fascinating because uh, he knows a lot more about music publishing than, oh, most people on the planet. First of all, though, let's talk about some uh, music business news. First thing is the Wu-Tang Clan. And for those of you who uh, have been following it, they've come out with a new album called The Wu, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. And ordinarily, that wouldn't be much of a big deal, except of the way they're marketing this and it's quite unique and it's brilliant they're making one copy only that's one copy that's all and what they're doing is they're putting it up for auction but only after it goes on a tour of museums and it's a listening tour so if people want to listen to it want to hear it before they uh, place a bid they can go to a local museum when the album is there, and they can have a listen. And, of course, they can't do any copying. They're going to have to give up their cell phones and any kind of other devices before they go in. But that being said, um, there's just one copy, and that's it. Now, it's kind of a super-duper special copy, and it looks really good, and it comes in a nice tin, and I think there's 38 songs. And, of course, they haven't done an album in 10 years or so, so if you're a fan, this is a big deal. But here's the cool thing about it. Now, first of all, they've already received bids as high as $5 million for this one album. But here's what they've done. And you may not realize how right on they are in terms of their marketing. And whether they knew they were doing this or not, I don't know. But this is an example, a perfect example of something called the economics of free. And economics of free is a theory that was put out by Chris Anderson a few years ago. And Chris Anderson, I don't know if he still is, but he he used to be an editor at Wired Magazine. And the long tail is also, for those of you who know what that is, that's also one of his theories. But... Here's what the economics of free means, and here's what Wu-Tang Clan did in order to follow that. First of all, economics of free means there's two types of products that every musician, artist, producer, everybody in the music business has. The first product is what they call infinite, and infinite products are, are virtual products. They're products that doesn't take much to make. After you you made the first one, you spent all the time producing an album, for instance, and it's digital only. It doesn't cost you anything to make X number of copies after that. So the beauty of this is that now you can actually give those away if you want. It doesn't cost you anything. Because what that does is it helps the second product. The second product that you have are the scarce products. And the scarce products are things like maybe a box set of all of your CDs, and you only make a few of them. Um, Maybe it's something like uh, an experience. An experience would be a backstage tour. Uh, It would be something like coming to, uh, having a meet and greet with the artist or band. It would be something like maybe uh, having a lunch or dinner with the artist or band. Maybe it would be something like the artist actually composing a song for you. These are very experiential things, and in fact, people will pay more for them because there's a lot fewer of them. So there's two types of, t- of products that everybody has, infinite and scarce. Okay, so there's two principles involved in all of this. The first principle is you give away your infinite products in order to sell the scarce ones. So in other words, nobody will buy your scarce pro- products until you actually have 
enough of the infinite ones on the market. So for instance, if you put your videos out there, which after you produce them, they don't cost anything, the more they're out there, the more people know about you. If you give away your music and it's on uh, pirated sites and and it's everywhere you can think of and it's streaming and all of those things, it's just available everywhere. Well, all of a sudden more people know about you. So that makes everything else a lot more valuable. So anyway, we go to the second principle. Second principle is the scarcer a product is, the higher you can charge for it. So the way this works is you see uh, bootleggers do this a lot, but I'm talking about CD bootleggers. Uh, what they would do is they would print a thousand of them and they would number them, sequentially number them. So you had number 15 of 500, whatever the case. And that would make it more valuable or it would seem more valuable to the person buying it. The fewer there, there were, the more valuable they become. Well, Wu-Tang Clan has taken this to the extreme. There's only one. That's all. So they can charge a whole lot more for it. And as you can see, or what I just told you, there was a lot more uh, higher bids than they ever expected from this so far. And, and they haven't even started the auction yet, so who knows how high this is going to go. Why do I bring this up? Well, it's kind of interesting that Wu-Tang did this, but on the other hand, think about this. This could be the future of music sales. And the way this could work is, well, you're not selling a lot of CDs anywhere, anyway, or a lot of physical products. Why not try to sell fewer of them for more money? So for instance, instead of, of pressing 50,000, I'm just saying for a major label that might do this, why don't you just press a thousand up, sequentially number them, and then see if people will pay more. And especially if a big time fan, if an Uber fan, if a super fan would pay more. And it's entirely possible that you can make at least as much money or even more just from fewer sales as a result. So this is something I think might be the future of the music business in a funny sort of way. So look out for this in the future and just watch for Wu-Tang Clan to just see what's going to happen to this auction because uh, it'll be very interesting as it goes along. Okay, now for something in the music business here, or actually in music production we're going to talk about. Recently I posted on my big picture music blog, music production blog, and that's at uh, bobbyosinski.blogspot.com, a demo of Michael Jackson's Beat It. This is Michael Jackson's personal demo of his hit, Beat It. Interesting thing about this, and if you haven't heard it, go to my blog, do a search if, if you don't see it right away, and just have a listen to this. It's only two and a half minutes long, but it's brilliant. And it's brilliant because there are no instruments. Michael does everything with his voice. And you hear some of these wonderful harmonies that he does. But here's the point I'm trying to make with this. The groove that he gets, considering there are no instruments, there's no drums or anything. There's, it's just his voice. And yet, everything grooves along. And it's funny because Quincy Jones, his former producer once told me that Michael was the only guy he knew, the only singer that he knew that could actually create a groove with his voice. And usually the groove comes from the rhythm section of a band. And occasionally it might be from percussion or rhythm guitar, but Michael could actually do it from his voice, which is really amazing. So it's worth listening to that because it's so, so cool. The groove is really important. And we take it for granted. But if you're mixing a song, one of the things that all the great mixers do is they try to find the groove. The groove is very is first. And what's, what is a groove? It's the pulse of the song. You have to find the instruments that are creating the pulse of the song. And once you find that, you can build around everything else. You can build everything else around the groove. And that's how one of the secrets to a great mix anyway 
that you find that groove first. Now, obviously, if a song doesn't have a groove, then you really can't have a great mix on it. It's just not going to happen because the groove has to happen somewhere in the song. And it doesn't matter. It could be a pop song. It could be a marching band. It could be, I mean, you name it, any kind of music, it all grooves. Classical music, when it's good, it grooves. It just pulls you along. You can feel the pulse, and the pulse just melts with your body. So next time you're listening to a song, see if, it, if you can identify the groove. See if you can feel what it is. Pick out the instruments and pick out what they're doing. And again, it'll... Most likely be the rhythm section, but maybe not. Listen for things like percussion. Sometimes there's a shaker that's buried in the mix, but is really pushing everything along. So just listen for those things and listen for the groove, and you'll find that your mixes will get better, your demos will get better, your songwriting will get better, everything will get better when you start to think more and more about the groove. Okay, let's bring our guest in, and this is... An old friend of mine, Richard Feldman, Richard's a very interesting guy because uh, he started his life in the music business as a songwriter, actually as a guitar player, and he was one of the first guys to go to Jamaica and kind of discover Jamaica and discover reggae. So when he moved to L.A., he was kind of like the only guy that knew that whole scene. When Bob Marley all of a sudden was breaking out, they all went to Richard because he knew what was going on. And he produced a lot of reggae records, a lot of kind of like fake reggae records by by L.A. bands, for instance, that wanted to do a reggae type of thing. But uh, he actually played with the reggae guys in Jamaica as well. And he's going to tell you a story pretty soon uh about one of those experiences, which you'll find pretty cool. Richard has also written hits for Eric Clapton. He's won a Grammy for producing Toots and the Maytals, and this is just a few years ago. He's also the former president of the American Independent Music Publishers, and he's the founder of a music library call, called Artists First Music. Once again, extremely knowledgeable on the subject of publishing and you'll hear for yourself. Here's Richard. My guest today is Richard Feldman. We go back a really long way, and uh, I can say that Richard is probably the most interesting person in the music business because uh, he's much more than a musician. He's uh, also a award-winning, Grammy-winning producer, uh, extremely knowledgeable on publishing, and also in the financial world, he's an MBA and has a stockbroker's license and manages um, a money fund and a uh, smart guy all the way around. So welcome, Richard. Thank you for that uh, uh, elaborate introduction. Uh, you know what? I want to go one place before. I, I, today's a publishing day, and uh, you know so much about publishing that I want to talk about, but let's... Go back to Jamaica, because you just tell the best story about when you played down there, the modeling story. Can you tell us that? Uh, okay. I didn't know I'd be called to call on that, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, this is uh, actually the whole this will tie into publishing, frankly. Um, this is uh, when I was uh, much younger and had written a song, and Eric Clapton had recorded it, and it was to be his single. And there were people calling me up trying to see if they could administer it. And frankly, at that time, I wasn't even sure what they were talking about. Uh, but I had been called, I was a guitar player, and I'd been called to play on an album by Inner Circle. And the reason I thought I was being called was because I knew a lot about reggae, which I did. But if I'd thought about it a minute, why would they be calling me to come down from Los Angeles and to play in Kingston to play reggae? And there's plenty of guitar players. There. Long story short... Uh, I got in the studio and they kept yelling at me something and I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but muggle it. I couldn't figure it out, but long story short, it was model it. And they wanted me to flash out as a guitar player. And, um, it turns out they wanted me to play like a journey, Neil Sean. And I didn't play like that and probably couldn't play like that. So the whole thing ended up in a pretty bizarre experience, except I will add this one thing. I don't think I've ever told you. So I had lots of calls with, um, 
Warner Brothers was trying to administrate it, and, and they were calling me from their home. They lived in an area of Kingston called Beverly Hills. And uh, apparently the uh, police got wind of all this and thought I was doing some drug deal or something. <laughs> So, you know, so goes it. <laughs> do, do they still call it modeling? They still use that term? I, I, I don't know. They have so many unique, you know, terms that uh, uh, I would imagine they do. But I, I don't, I actually don't know. I, no one's ever asked me to model since then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about publishing. What do you see as the state of publishing today? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, it is, in my opinion in flux and i say that because uh, it is, is challenged by many uh i would say synergistic developments that all the root technology plays a part of course and um it is also gained importance uh obviously since people don't buy records uh you would see that songs publishing can be very important when you sync things and license things for other uses. So I go back to my statement. It's in flux. I, if I were to predict, it, will there be kind of overall more publishing in for, income in the future than now? For me, I'm not sure there will be. Um, but it'll still play a vital, vital role in music. One of the interesting things is that it seems like so many young artists and bands uh, are focusing so much energy on on syncs and licensing these days. It, it, it seems like they've taken their eye off of a record deal and look are looking more this way. Is, is that do you see it that way as well? Oh, absolutely, and you can see it if nothing else in the number of uh, summits and and uh, conferences on music sync. A sync is uh, playing a huge role in, at least in the front end, on music business right now, and you can tell that by uh, the number of sync conferences and books on sync and webinars, seminars, and such. The uh, reality is uh, that it is only about 1.2% or 320 million of the total music revenue. Is that uh, all? That, wow. That's, that's all. A very small amount. But here's the key, and I said that kind of with, you know, kind of shocked to someone. They said, yeah, but, and I think the but is you get the right advertisement with your song on it. That's the same as having a hit record uh, on the Billboard charts. Uh, in other words, it's awareness, and there is so much clutter in the world right now because there's so much music and there's so many ways to get it. Getting discovered is important, and advertising is a way that will, uh, let's say, make people aware of your music. So look at all the bands that kind of became huge, either on Grey's Anatomy or the iTunes commercials and such. So though it represents a small portion of the actual total revenue, if you're the lucky one to get a big sync fee, that's great, but it also helps innumerably in, in terms of the um, revenue that you're going to get, at, at least from that awareness. Now, when artists are bringing you songs, are they bringing you songs that are minus the vocals or with vocals, and does that matter? Uh, well, I think you're talking about bringing me songs. The only reason they bring me a song is I have a company that uh, uh, places music in film and television, and some gaming. and um, The company's name is Artist First, by the way. Yeah, Artist, Artist yeah. First Music, actually. Uh, and uh, so you definitely need an instrumental. Uh and when people deliver that uh, music, I often have to ask for it, but some who know the game will deliver it with instrumental. Now, what you do is it, you retitle everything when you get it, though, right? No, no, no. Um, in fact, I don't do retitling anymore. Oh, you don't? Uh, no, I don't. And and I lots and lots of people do. In fact, there's huge companies that do. Um and this is a, it's a great point to bring up because retitling is this huge, uh, issue that sits out there in the world. And, um, the reality is that there are ways for people to tell whether something is the source of music. So let's say you have, this is, I don't know if you want this long of a discussion on yeah, it, but I yeah. can do it. Yeah, please. Okay. So if you have a song called Red and you have a song called Blue, but they're both the same song. 
they can be registered with different publishers. It'll be the same writer, but different publishers. And they can be uh, uh, registered at the same performing rights organization. Now, when Red is in a TV show, or Red uh, is in a whatever it would be, uh, and Blue is in a TV show, or whatever it is, they are distinguished by something called a cue sheet. And that is the arbiter of what that particular song is. And a cue sheet's necessary because not only does it identify the song, but it identifies the use. So, for example, if it was a background or it was a theme or whatever, those are all paid on different rates by the performing rights societies. The negative with that is that has been brought, you know, to the front is that there is technology now that is able to track, uh, audio and, uh, that audio then is, is basically they do it with a, imp, a fingerprint of that particular sound wave. And they say that song is that, whether it's called red or blue, that song comes up. And therein lies a confusion, which many people say is a problem. It's adjudicated by the cue sheet, though. And um, there's other reasons I could get into why people are against retitling and uh, for retitling. I will tell you this, that... Uh, and I, I've never actually studied the statistics on this, but of the total number of songs that are registered, say, to ASCAP or BMI, I would imagine a significant number are registered as two different songs, but the same actual audio file. Wow. Now, now it seems like there's a lot of uh, professional writers, and, and we know a bunch of them, that are just uh, cranking out backing tracks specifically for television. And I'm wondering if their business is taking a hit because so many artists and bands want to get involved in that. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I would say um, you can actually apply that same question and, and reverse it um, with the standpoint that there are lots of um, libraries out there. And, you know, for your listeners, just to understand what a production library is. It's a company that will license a whole batch of songs. It's called a blanket license to, say, a network. And they can use as many of those as they want. They don't have to individually um, uh, get a mechanical and a sync license for that song, or rather a master license and a sync for that. It's all under this blanket, so to speak. And um, those libraries used to be pretty crummy, just kind of synthesizer, you know, fake stuff and whatever. Well, come today, some of the larger uh, libraries have actually tried to break artists out of their libraries. And so the material is very good. And in fact, uh, it's competition to the record companies or to the artists who have their own material and don't want to put it in a library. So you'll find, and they bring the fees down as well uh, because they blanket licenses from libraries will generally be lower um, for a fee for a song. So it, it's it's working both ways. Now, isn't it true that music supervisors are kind of like the new A&R guys? Or they like to think of, of themselves as that? <laughs> well, I, I would definitely say the latter. And they are the A&R guys. Um, it, it's a little different, though, because in, if you want to do kind of an analogous um, comparison, um, A&R guy might, be, might report to the um, head of A&R, and then that person would then sign the band, and then that person might stay on to you know, mentor the band and make sure the product sounds good. In the case of music supervision, you have additional upper layers. The, the music supervisor will, let's say, be a screener or a filter. You could say an A&R guy. And he will then give those to the director. The director then is probably beholden to upper echelon in his management world, which could be producers or network executives or whatever. So I'm not taking away anything from music supervisors, but they're one step in a chain. It makes you wonder how anybody gets anything licensed. That being the uh, case. Uh, to a guy, we, we get at Artist First... Uh, I said we have a production library, but we also have an artist representation library uh, catalog, a roster, if you will. And um, we get search requests all the time. And um, 
those requests. We fill them as dutifully as we can. And at one point, I just the guy was kind of putting me through some backflips, one of the music supervisors, and I said, just out of interest, you know, how many submissions do you get for this specific thing that he'd asked for? He said, oh, three or four hundred. <sighs> you know, so it, it's a it's a tough game, uh, very very competitive. Um, if you have something that's a hit, name recognized, um, it will get it will definitely get attention. You know, and um, you know you can. The Black Keys are a great example, you know, and it, and, and, and it probably goes through the chain that I once learned when I came out of here as a guitar player, right? going to Jamaica and what have you. You know, you probably heard it, but it's, uh, you know, who are the Black Keys? Get me the Black Keys. Get me a, a Black Keys. And then who are the Black Keys? Yeah, yeah, right, right. And that's the trajectory that I see because there was, you know, everyone wanted Florence and uh, Machine or, you know. Well, speaking of which then, so you have the Black Keys and Florence and Machine and, and other acts like that, and they have, they've already had name recognition. They're, they have high visibility. So how does a new act go up against that? I mean, you'd think that anybody that's signed and already has, has uh, records out in the market that they would have such a leg up. It would be really difficult to, um, to, to actually compete with them. Well, the key is, uh, um, it's on the financial side, replace <laughs> the no. black key. So you can't afford the black keys if you're a TV station or a TV show or many movies, and you just don't have a budget. The top budget, the, the absolute top cap, if you will, generally these days is $30,000 for both sides, meaning publishing and master, for a, t- for a big TV show. And it goes all the way down there to... Uh, you know, probably 50 bucks in all the beer you can drink. You know, it, it, it's a wide range. So if you have the right band and the right sound and you're replacing a band that is they can't afford in a montage scene, it could be a great deal. That's way down from where it used to be, isn't it? 30 grand? You mean at, the top, at the top end? Yeah. Um, I don't know if that, I, I don't know. Uh, that's That's kind of, that's kind of been up there for a while. I'm talking about TV shows, and I'm not talking about the theme or the closing credits. I'm yeah, talking about just kind of a use in in the in the TV show. Um, but you know, the, the range is all over. You know, the, the reality shows um, they get a lot of music for free, and uh, when they want something, they don't pay very much for it. Um, a song, a, a show like True Blood, that's yeah. going to pay more. Well, tell me about artists first. How did you come to start that? I, I know you, you've been in publishing forever, and, and you've always owned your your publishing, and uh, you know a lot about it, but what brought you to the fact that you wanted to start your own library? Uh, it, it was actually Pump Audio, um, and I originally did it as a technology play, and I thought there was a better way to do it than Pump Audio was doing it, and I was probably deceived in thinking that, but um, there was, you know, I was trying to infuse it with things that Amazon and Netflix uses, or so to speak, of um, suggesting, if you like this one, then you'll like this one, and to really put a lot in there. So I kind of developed a business plan and worked on that, and finally met with some, uh, with a a great individual who um, helped me a great deal, who was a dyed-in-the-wool he actually was on the other side of it. He licensed music from uh, uh, production music companies. And so when he showed me the light, I decided that it was probably better to build a quality and go with quality over quantity. Pump Audio, which was later sold to Getty Images, that is not necessarily quality. There could be some good material there, but their idea is to get as much music as they can. At any rate, that then, with the library started and trying to build that, I then uh, started becoming acquainted with bands who were good, who wouldn't want to be in a library. And on, in those cases, I formed a company, which was a sister company to Artist First Music, the production company, to Artist First Music, the agency company. And in those cases, just for your listeners to understand, you would give up your publishing for a production company, for an agency, you wouldn't necessarily give up your publishing. There are agencies that do that, but there are many that don't. And so all you're giving up is the um, the synchronization fee that is a pre-negotiated fee on the front end. 
and you would give a portion of that to the company that got that placement for you. Is it a fee or is it a split? Well, I, sorry, excuse me. It's a commission. Yeah. Okay. So commission based. So, so, so sorry for the confusion. So there's a commission on the fee, and a fee is a license fee. So a song, for example, that's used in a TV show, there would be two licenses: a license for the publishing, the composition, and a license for the master. And those generally are MFN, so they're going to be the same rate. And um, in the case that we're speaking of where there would be a sync fee, then an agency would take a portion of that thousand, five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, thirty. The highest it seems to be is around fifty, and that seems to be kind of the top limit for there, but it goes down anywhere from there. Twenty percent being a bottom line. And um the important thing though is now let's say that particular song is placed um and used on T V, there's a performance uh, royalty generated when it's played on TV. Only the artist and the writer and the publisher would enjoy that under an agency. What does MFN mean? Uh, what the, you, you tell me. It means uh, Perry Pursue. It means that each side gets the same thing. Oh, Most Favored Nations. Oh, oh, got it. Okay, right. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so in other words, generally that's how it's done. I'll just, just a nuance to this, if you're interested... You know, to understand uh, very easily, uh, like I want to hold your hands uh, by the Beatles might be better than I want to hold your hands by Lowell Folsom. And by the way, um, that's a great version if anyone wants to hear it. <laughs> but he's an old blues guy, and I think it's more valuable with um, the Beatles, uh, at least for recognition value. And so you would find that that license would go out at a much higher rate. So the publisher might always get what he wants, but the master side would not get the MFN when it's not the original master that accompanies that composition. Catalogs are going up in value, aren't they? It's it's worth it to uh, have a catalog. Well, going up from where would be the question. Um, uh, they're going up from where they found themselves in 2008, but they've come down even. They have not increased in value above where they were pre-Great Recession. Uh, Pre-Great Recession, you found that the catalogs were getting um, uh, bid on by uh, private equity groups, venture capital groups, all sorts of people like that. And the same actually started in, in you know before the dot-com crash. So the valuations got um, definitely exaggerated, I would say, in that period, came down in 2008. And, you know, it's once again, for the good stuff, they're high multiples for average stuff. Maybe they're they're definitely not going up. Well, define but, define that though. What's the difference? Ah, excellent question. The good stuff they're called evergreen catalogs, and they're simply called evergreen because they earn the same every year, and might have done so for years and years and years. And uh, what happens is just so you understand that in performance income and I would say mainly more of that than mechanical income. But performance income, if you reach a certain level, it's kind of in the American songbook. And that song pretty much earns the same thing every year. And uh, so an example might be Higher and Higher, that song that Jackie Wilson originally made famous, and I forget when, you know, a long time ago. And it probably had a huge peak in the beginning, and probably since about 1990, has been making the same amount every year um, in terms of performance. Its total income could go up a little bit if it was, say, used in a commercial, and then one year it wasn't, so from year to year it might vary. But generally, it's going to have a, an average over three years that has been very consistent because it's such a great song. So it's earning history with an evergreen song that will make that different than, I'll, I'll make some example up, uh, a, a rap song that, you know, has a huge airplay in the beginning, but then kind of falls off. And that will not um, earn or be valued as highly as something that's earned over the 20 years. Yeah, I would think, you know, hip hop and um, electronica, EDM, stuff like that, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't exactly call any of those titles evergreen, would you? 
You wouldn't, but you know, I, I, I don't know. Just as a listener, I hear that song "Wake Me Up" or whatever it's called by um, Avicii. I guess is the guy's name. Right, right. Uh, and uh, I think that's that song's going to be around. You know, and that song could be done as you hear it in the song. You can do that as a country song, or you can do it as an EDM. So the underlying copyright strong. So that may be the other significant factor. But in general, you're absolutely right. These these songs are more trends than they are um, long-term copyrights. In fact, much of music being written these days doesn't have that enduring quality and thus doesn't command those high multiples. Why do you think that is? Is, uh, is, it, part of, is, is it the way songwriters write these days or, or producers basically do the tracks first and then you know the vocalist does or the artist comes in and writes a melody against it or why do you think um uh, i'm gonna hazard a guess I, I suppose again technology is is at the root of it and it's the idea that you know um in the in the in days gone by you know if you had a song um you had to really get that song in good shape before you recorded it because recording it was expensive. And if you recorded it, you know, you wanted to make sure that it was a good one and would stay. And so you were going to make sure that the song itself was catchy or had meaning or whatever, all these things. These days, as you know, everyone knows, you can sit there and, you know, sing in garage band, sing out of key and uh, out of time and um, just say some kind of, you know, catchy things here and there, and the thing could be a hit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it would be the kind of hit, again, that maybe doesn't, you know, last. You know, it, it, some people also say, and I don't know this for a fact, of course, every song is a romantic, you know, is a love song of some sorts. But I think lately there's been songs that probably test that litmus test, you know, a little bit, and they don't have that... Um, kind of universal sensibility that that songs in the past had. And, you know, I'm sure the same thing was said about Cole Porter when rock came in and whatever. So, you know, it, I could be completely wrong here. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting how things have gone. Everything has, has changed a whole bunch. But, uh, you know, I'm wondering, is it... I, there's just a, a report that I just saw. It was a CBS and uh, Vanity Fair. They did... Uh, together a poll and uh, just on musical tastes and one part of the poll says what was the decade that had the worst music and an overwhelming majority said this decade and all the previous ones were about the same give or take you know a percent or two and you know but then again it makes you wonder does everybody say that in the decade they're in, or is it this really something different? I don't know. What I, do you think? I don't know. I, I have to think that, you know, that some of the songs in the 80s were so bad they're good, <laughs> you know, is what I have to say. So, you know, it, it, you're right. They can be rediscovered on another level, and thus they're all the same. Um, I, I just, you know, this is a much larger question about, you know, how technology has played a part in... in uh, shaping what music is. And, you know, I would give you this thought that, you know, in probably if you looked at the billboard or whatever chart you wanted to look at, it would be very difficult to find any song that more than one or two people played on at the same time. And if you pick a certain era before Pro Tools and whatever, you would find uh, that uh, every song had players on it, and certainly they were overdubs. And if you go a little further back, the whole thing had to be recorded at once, which means an engineer had to be trained like crazy to get perfect sounds. And the performance had to be the performance of your life. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to now, you can do 30 takes on in Pro Tools and kind of piece together something. And I think that, that it's had ultimately a negative effect on... I think the quality of that, I realize you were talking about writing really, and I'm talking about production, but they're two are kind of go hand in hand. And, uh, certainly with, you know, EDM, you know, all you need is a great beat and one phrase that goes over and over and you're done. That's not a song. Uh, let me ask you a question. I, and this is about pitching songs. I can remember when I first got into town 
and talking to a bunch of songwriters that had, you know, some reasonable credits. And it seemed like even though they had good publishers, the way they got their cuts was that they actually went out and they did all the legwork. They did what they could to to meet an artist when they heard an artist was looking for a song and and they just did whatever they could to get the songs in front of people that were looking for them. Is that still the case? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, that where... I should make a statement to clarify that. Uh, On the big dollar songs, where someone's whole career is to be a writer, in other words, I would say not. In terms of people getting together and writing, and you know, you could find yourself, you know, let's say you live in Minneapolis and there's a really cool band, and you want to, you know, you think you could write a song with the lead singer or whatever. Probably that would work out. But the way it's kind of going now, um, the big writers are basically writer producers, and they will oftentimes be from Sweden for some reason. (laughs) Yeah, right. And, you know, they'll work with the artist or they'll work with someone who does top line. And, you know, they bring in a track that is, you you don't have to listen to it twice to think it's just a smash. Yeah. And um, so in simple terms, the the way it's done now, you might not want to get in front of an artist. You, You want to be put with an artist in the room to create the music. Yeah, that's a good point. That's way different than it used to be, for sure. It is. It is. The 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 songwriter, like a songwriter like Diane Warren is a great one or whatever, I, I would have to think there are just fewer and fewer of those type of pure songwriters. I would think there are people that are as good as her, and um, but, they're, but they probably can run Pro Tool Session along but, with it. But how about Nashville, though? Isn't, isn't it different there, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Much much different. So you're right. I, I'm just focusing that way. And Nashville still has that. But I'm sure uh, if you have, I just happened to see the I, I forget what it's called ACM Awards. I may have it wrong. Yeah. But uh, you know, and it, even though George Strait was given you know the accolades he was given, ninety nine percent of the performances were just very glitzy, but very uncountry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Music and. Um, I would think that some of that music is being written with a production team rather than a, a guy who really sat there and chewed on a pencil and came up with a great hook. Yeah, it's really slick these days, country music, uh, modern country music. Uh, and I guess that's good. I mean, it, it moves music forward. But on the other hand, it's kind of like 70s, 80s rock in a way with fiddles and you know, fiddles and, and steel guitars, isn't it? Sort of? Yeah, but, you know, I, in, in gross terms, the guy that was, you know, throwing a bale of hay into the pickup truck is now doing it and then going home and smoking crack or doing heroin. <laughs> so, you know, the the world has become urban urbanized, and though there may be the roots of country in there, they, to sell, they've got to do the, the you know, you've got to look like uh, Beyonce and talk like Dolly Parton. Going a, a slightly different direction, what are the mistakes that people make with publishing? Uh, well, one that I've seen uh, is to sell at a low fee or give away your publishing too quick. And the problem with that is is that you can't go to companies like my company and do an independent deal. Um, and I'll, I can be a little more clear. It, it's the idea that at a certain point, a publishing deal is probably a great source of revenue and a great partner to have if you have a great publisher. And, you know, by publisher, I have to think of the three-letter publishers, you know, because, uh, you know, if you're talking about, you know, BMG and, you know, companies like that, um, they will be um, probably giving you some pretty good money. But if you're kind of below that tier and it's kind of a on-the-come thing where they say they'll take their publishing if they do something for you or whatever – you can find yourself, let's say, as a young band coming up and having to sell your publishing because you think it's important or because someone gives you some money um, for that publishing, and then you'll find you're encumbered by that relationship so that you've got your master. You never got a deal, let's say, in this example, but Sony or 
PMG or Universal or whoever has your publishing and you can't yourself as a one stop. That means both sides, meaning publishing and the master, do a deal with something. And we didn't really talk about that, but the supervisors are constantly frustrated by having to deal with uh, a particular rights holder that is either slow to respond or won't come down in price. And there could be good reasons they don't do that, but the person that suffers is the artist, especially if they don't really have a career at that point. Yeah. So, that, that's one thing. That's, a, that's in the weeds a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, you know, if you found someone that really believed in you who was a publisher, say you were a band and, and they really, and you really saw how they were going to help you, I, I think that's not a bad thing. There's not as much money in advances anymore, though, is there? No, n- not until you don't need it. <laughs> the same old thing in the business. It never changes, yeah, it, does it? No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But, yeah. uh, you know, that, that's an economic decision. It, you know, essentially, when you get to the point where you don't need it, uh, it becomes a bank with a free interest loan, essentially, because you're going to pay it back through your earnings. Um, but, um, you know, it, there's always uh, there's always someone that's going to do that, and there's always a company that, that bases themselves on that, you know. Yeah. How important is it for an artist or a, a band to have their own publishing company? Well, once again, it's it's the ability to negotiate deals uh, themselves. So let's the band would have their own master in the case that you're speaking of. So if you have the master and the publishing, you can work with uh, companies like us or agencies, sign up and not really give away anything except a commission on the front end. So that now when the song is, uh, let's say, it goes into syndication, it's a song that plays, you have the publishing you have the uh, master, and well, forget the master, there's not a payment there, but on the publishing, you'll be making money on that song forever. And uh, if it's with the publisher, you'll make some as a writer, but it'll only be half. Now someone else wants to use that song. They've got to go to the publisher, and then they come to you for the master, and things can go wrong. It can take too much time. All the, all the major publishers um, are incredibly... Uh, stretched, overworked. When Sony bought EMI, they uh, let go of a lot of people at EMI. So now it's one person doing twice the work that they were doing. And they're going to pay attention to the songs that are current hits or evergreens. And they're not going to pay attention to you once you're off the radar. So when you say how important it is for Van Evans Publishing, I would say it's very important to keep its publishing as long as they can or need to. And again, there could be a reason to sell it. Um, it you know, it, it, and it also, let's say you got a bunch of sinks and you did well and you get some place and there's some interest in you uh, for, a, uh, for a publishing deal. That publishing is going to be a whole lot more valuable than it would have been if you had sold that publishing early. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. Well, this has been great, Richard. Thank you for your time and uh, your expertise. Uh, it's always fun to talk, and uh, it was especially good today. Uh, so people could find Artist First by artistfirstmusic.com, right? That's right. They yeah. can. And uh, there's actually a way on the site, if you say search music, you can actually go to our back-end site, which is uh, <clears throat> a back-end white label um, uh, platform, uh, created by Source Audio, I'll just give a little plug for them, which is a terrific uh, way to amass and aggregate a lot of material and be able to search on it. So our website's really just a hello card, and the uh, if you go to search artists or search library, you can start to dig into what artists we represent and what kind of production music we represent. Very but, cool. Uh, yeah, no, happy to do it and uh, enjoy talking to you. Yeah, likewise, Richard. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. And if you want to find out more about Richard Feldman and Artist First Music, go to artistsfirstmusic.com. And that's artists with an S. It's plural. Artistsfirstmusic.com. And you'll see what they do and you'll get an idea about how music publishing, how music library publishing works. Anyway, thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, 
Send them to questions at bobbyosinski.com or questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com, and I'll get them either way. Uh, probably questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com would be better, but either way, I'll get them. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com, select the podcast tab, or else just go directly to bobbyoinnercircle.com. At bobbyosinski.com, you're going to find links to my blogs and coaching programs, as well as a sign-up uh, form for my newsletter. So you'll get up-to-date news about what's going on, some special offers, some book excerpts that are exclusive, some interviews that are exclusive, uh, some uh, outtakes from podcasts that uh, don't really get on the air that you might find interesting. It's worth it being a member. So go to bobbyosinski.com and you can find all that stuff. I'm Bobby Osinski, and I will see you next time. 